I'm so excited to be here with Kevin Chu, uh, co-founder of Kabam, um, because he had this amazing exit, uh, really phenomenal exit, and then he chose blockchain um, as his next venture. And so our session today is about, you know, what it's like to build a company in the traditional world. <laughs> and then take that expertise and bring it into blockchain. Can you tell us why you picked blockchain, of all things, uh, following your exit for Kabam? That's a great question. Um, I think you know, the, the, the reason for that is actually because I'm just incredibly passionate about this space. So uh, I think that, let me just start with, I think you know, entrepreneurs uh, trying to build a company in 2019, you know, 2018, this idea that we're going to build, um, you know, a free product, give it away, take a bunch of user data, monetize it somehow over time, do an IPO, I think that's, you know, it's, it's just not interesting. I think this idea, the ethos of blockchain in terms of what does it mean to be truly decentralized? What does it mean to have a true community all over the world participate in the network and create value together mm -hmm. in that network? Um, what does it mean to really understand the technology of you know, blockchain and how do we create something that's immutable, distributed, open source? These things are uh, things I didn't think about when I started Kabam in 2006. Um, but having built a quote unquote traditional company for 11 years, uh, we grew it to you know, $400 million in revenue. We had 1,000 employees all across the world, and then we started dealing with headaches like, what does it mean to prepare to go public? What does it mean to, um, you know, to kind of grow revenues and grow profitability and show that in a public marketplace? You know, all those things are kind of the traditional way of sort of creating a, a company. I think the ethos of blockchain and, and what Satoshi started in this space, you know, 10, 11 years ago at this point, um, is just fascinating, and I think we're, there's a future where um, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley but, and all over the world think that it's going to be a lot more exciting, a lot more mission-driven to go build uh, software that embodies this ethos of this space much more than it is to build a more traditional you know, company, right? And I think that that passion is already kind of spreading, which is why you know, we're here today and then why there's blockchain weeks all over the world. Um, and I think the first kind of quote unquote, I don't know, traditional entrepreneur um, or new entrepreneur that does it and shows kind of the, the power and the economic value that you can create in the space while embracing this ethos, I think that's what's gonna tip it over and we're gonna have an explosion of new entrepreneurs chase this type of business model. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, you're, you were a pioneer in the gaming space. You really were. You pioneered free-to-play games, one of them. Um, and, and now you're moving into this new frontier of blockchain, which is almost like the next, um, the, the next evolution of the internet. Um, and so can you tell us what it was like? Now, your, your backers are Andreessen Horowitz and Coinbase. You have huge backers. But what was it like trying to raise money how did you sell? How did you pitch them on your idea? And can you share a little bit about that process? I think the, so we started Forte a um, little bit over, uh, about 15-ish you know, months ago at this mm -hmm. point. And it was a little bit funny. We walked into Andreessen's office and, um, and they basically, you know, we, we basically got to a deal without even a pitch. It was, I eventually did have to go, go do a pitch, but it was, it was this realization that, wow, real entrepreneurs who've had, who built real companies are coming into this space, and it almost doesn't matter what they want to do, we're, we're going to figure out a way to, to, to get involved. Um, so that was about 15 months ago. Things are a little bit different today where some of the craziness has kind of died down. Uh, but that was, uh, that was very much still the case in sort of mid-2018. Um, so I think there's a lot of power, like traditional venture capitalists who've been in the space for a while, um, they almost never, you know, it's, it's, it's very rare that a, a traditional VC, you know, spent two and a half years as a VC, will just back a pure idea, right? They're generally focused on what is the team, what is the execution, mm -hmm. 
what is the track record of that team before, especially as sort of at the early stage entrepreneurs. And so you know, the fact that I think some repeat entrepreneurs are coming after the space um, uh, has made it actually relatively you know, easy to, uh, to, to put capital together. And, and how have you been finding talent? I mean, blockchain is one thing, blockchain gaming is another. Um, yeah, how are you sourcing your talent? So this is probably one of the hardest things to do in this space. So we both look for uh, you know, people who really believe in the mission, uh, who understand that we're trying to build decentralized software um, or open source distributed software that the project is meant to be decentralized over time. We do have a very specific approach where we talk about something called progressive decentralization, <laughs> meaning that to get the network started and get products into the hands of users and get adoption, we do, um, there is a company and we are, uh, you know, there's a team of people who work in an office. We have four offices across the world at this point. Um, Amazing. But we, we do want to eventually be in a state where there is no more company that is uh, at the center of what Forte is doing, but instead we're, um, you know, a network where there's multiple participants and, and uh, uh, we build basically that platform for the whole gaming industry. There is a lot of excitement around Forte. You made a huge announcement at GDC this year about your $100 million uh, Ripple-backed fund um, to bring developers on board the platform. Tell us a little bit about the Forte platform. What is it? We are building a um, blockchain gaming platform, which means that at the core there is a protocol that we focus on. But then around that protocol, we do build a whole host of other uh, tools that game developers are used to using um, to enable existing games, but of course new, also new generations of games that are being built, um, to build their assets that are in the game to be on eventually a public blockchain. And, and so we basically think about soup to nuts, what are all the things that we need to do to make that easy um, you know, and um, uh, incorporate into their existing technology stack all the things that they would need to do to take assets in an existing game or a new game and put them onto a public blockchain. That's kind of how we first thought about this problem. And um, we're pretty excited to um, you know, be rolling it out right now. Yeah, and you've signed two really exciting developers. You want to tell us about them? We announced uh, just recently two developers. So one is Disruptor Beam. Uh, Disruptor Beam is a fantastic game uh, developer that's built. Uh, they've had a long history of games. Um, I think the company's been around for uh, almost 10 years. And they've, they work with very, very large IP. So everything from Game of Thrones to Walking Dead to Star Trek to you know, many others, they've, uh, they've become one of sort of Hollywood's trusted partners to take that IP and put it into a game world. And so um, because they've been around for so long and have built a number of games, they're building their own kind of internal tool set for uh, you know, just making games in general. And we're working with them at that level to incorporate Forte's technology into um, you know, their tool set so that they can roll it out across uh, you know, their games. Um, then we have a second developer that we just announced called Other Ocean. And Other Ocean has a game called Bra, and that stands for Battle Royale um, Unsung Heroes. And it's actually a, a browser-based game that has a massive audience you know, playing it. And it's a battle royale that you can play in any web browser. And uh, it's very easy. You drop in for a quick game that could just take a few minutes. And uh, we're incorporating um, you know, Forte's tech into what they're rolling out for season three, which should be pretty soon. Uh, so we're pretty excited about a pretty unique approach. So you mentioned the Ripple um, fund that we have put together before. Our approach at Forte is not to work with you know, new games yet. Uh, that, that'll come. But we knew that if we started working with new games, it would take a year, two years to even get a game to market. And then in the gaming industry, not every game becomes a hit game, uh, as we all know. And so you, know, you work with these new games. They may or may not work. Uh, they may or may not even launch. So our strategy was to go after and work with game developers that already have games in the market and have large existing player bases, have real revenues behind those games already, and work with them to take parts of that economy and put it right onto blockchain. 
Yeah, tell us a little bit about um, what, what are you looking for in a game developer, like daily active users, you know, what thresholds are you looking for, and so forth? So we started with a pretty simple criteria, which was to, to people outside the gaming industry may not make as much sense, but we started with this criteria that a game has to be live for at least two years. Um, so there's a number of reasons we do that. Number one is that if a game has made it to two years, uh, it's a real business. There's no game company that keeps a game around for two years for fun. Um, you know, two years is, is a long time to put real resources onto a project. And so having a game be around for at least two years means that there's an existing base of revenue that's important to that business. It's also past the kind of crazy time. So meaning that a lot of new games, when you first launch it, you're just busy fixing bugs. You sort of realize, oh my gosh, my players are doing this with this design, and I, I didn't anticipate that, so I had to go you know, figure out how to uh, you know, deal with that. And they're on what's called the content treadmill, which is that game to, you know, gamers want to come back and play something fresh and interesting all the time. And so you're constantly creating new content uh, and new experiences for that players. And then that first year, especially, is really you're sort of all consumed with, with doing that. Um, and so we wanted to get to a place where the game developer uh, has a real business on their hands. Uh, there's a player base that, there's a player community and a player base that loves that game and has been around and playing it for a while. Um, and there's a real economy to start uh, playing with. And so, and then within that universe, we look for very a few very specific things. One is that we look for games that have a very um, deep item economy already right. in it, right? So there's some games that are, uh, you go into the game and there's literally tens of thousands of items in that game already. Um, and so that's really interesting for us to be able to take a portion of that economy and uh, put it onto blockchain so that's not as if the game developer is putting, they don't have to risk the entire economy <clears throat> and put it onto a public blockchain to oh. start with. Oh, just certain items. They can just choose certain, that's which right. items. Oh, okay. That's right. So we have uh, game developers that are putting um, small slices of their game onto mm. Uh, blockchain, and then there's some other game developers that are putting the, actually the core economy onto blockchain because they believe in, um, you know, they believe in it uh, quite a bit. And then on top of that, we then look we then look for a player base of at least 50,000 daily actives, um, because with that kind of a player base, there's generally and with the right types of games, there's already some form of user to user or player to player interactions, and you know, and what we're working with developers on is to then take those and make them a public blockchain transaction over time. Yeah, that's very interesting. What size checks are you writing? Um, so we've gone as big as five million, um, and we do uh, checks you know, in the, uh, that are all the way you know, as small as $100,000 if a game developer wants to, to do something smaller with us. And something pretty unique about the fund is that we're, we're not an equity, you know, it's not an equity fund, we're not trying to tick a you know, slice of equity of a company. It doesn't make sense to set up a decentralized you know, protocol that way. We actually feel, we actually, these are just pure adoption grants. And so the beauty of what we're, we're doing with Ripple and, and they believe in this mission with us is that, um, you know, it's, it's not about trying to, you know, recoup this fund or show return. It, this is purely about driving the adoption uh, by gamers who are already playing with digital assets. It's about driving adoption of you know, blockchain. And so we give these, uh, these grants away, up to $5 million, that are, there's no equity, we don't recoup any of it, there's no rev share, it's, it's a pure adoption you know, fund. But what this does is it allows us to go to a game developer that has, you know, right now, our largest game developer has $100,000 or $100 million a year in revenue in one of the games that we're working with. It allows them to say, okay, I know that if I put a team onto you know, something, I'm gonna make this much money. And I can't put, if I'm gonna adopt blockchain technology into my game, I can't have that team, I have to have that team work on something really risky. Um, and we basically go to them and have a fund that allows them to take the risk off the table and say, okay, we can put my, I could put my engineering team to work on this project for a month or two months, and that um, uh, the opportunity cost of doing so is not so big. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so how many developers are you looking to sign this year? We're almost done. <laughs> We're almost done with the year. But how many, how many, like, you've obviously only announced two, but you've signed a lot more. How many have you signed? We have over 15 uh, major gaming partners already. Since yep. March. Oh, that's fantastic. Are you looking to sign any more before the end of the year? 
we will definitely sign some more by the end of the year, yep. And then when are we going to start to see the first games come off the Forte platform? December 9th. <gasps> OK, how exciting. All right, we'll watch for that announcement. Um, you know, we just had, uh, I just interviewed Kevin Wheel on stage earlier this morning. Um, and we're talking about uh, Libra. Libra's coming out next year. Um, and I wanted to get your thoughts um, on, on how confident are you that they're going to be able to scale the Libra blockchain? Thoughts on maybe um, the move programming language if you could share with us? Um, I'm a big fan of move. I think it's one of the uh, most production ready, you know, sort of blockchain code out there. Um, you know, it just, it just shows that they, you know, the, they have, you know, I don't know, Facebook quality engineers that are working on, on that project. And so the, the code base is one of the kind of uh, you know, most robust code bases out there. Um, I think there's a lot of open questions still about Libra and so forth and all the regular time. I'm not an expert on any of that stuff. Um, you know, but I, I do think that the more uh, companies that really build out technology and really think through uh, all the challenges of deploying code um, into the space, I think that's just beneficial for the entire space. Okay, great. And so oh. you're, you guys have launched on the Ethereum blockchain, is that correct? Um, but are, are you moving into, like, uh, are you going to be platform agnostic, or can you talk to us a little bit about that? And so we, uh, we think, you know, specifically the, the deal that we've done with Ripple, we're very fo focused on Interledger uh, as a, a major protocol that we're supporting. So we think about a world in games especially that um, there's, there's different games that are going to be incorporating blockchain technology into them in very different ways. So for example, if there's games that you have incredibly valuable objects, like there's a game that we're working with um, where we think that some of the, I should say the designers think that some of the assets will be worth many, many thousands of dollars. You know, there's a certain type of public blockchain that you'll want to use to secure uh, very high value assets um, that don't transact that frequently. And then we have some other games, for example, that are designing uh, rewards into their games where every day a player comes in and they're earning a reward. They could combine those rewards together. They could trade them with other, they could trade, they could sell, they can use them as crafting materials for all sorts of other things. So high frequency you know, transac transactions that are very low value. And so there's other different types of layer ones, I think, over time that you know, may be better for that that are dramatically different than what you would secure you know, highly valuable assets on. And so, we work with game developers to um, use the right technology for their game, depending on the game design. And we think that there's going to be a world where there's not just one blockchain that sort of dominates every single use case that you could possibly have for a digital asset or financial transaction, but there'll be a world where there's multiple blockchains that are designed for you know, very specific purposes for a while. Uh, we certainly see that today in 2019, and I think it'll continue to be the case going into 2020. And so Interledger allows us to uh, basically have, even, even in one game, the ability for players to use different types of assets um, on different chains. But certainly if a player is playing many different types of games and they want to you know, move value between different types of games over time, um, we think about all these different use cases and how do we um, you know, make that happen. Um, so it's very interesting. Would the Forte platform help it sounds like the Forte platform might help any company, like say maybe Ubisoft, who wants to, Ubisoft being very progressive in the gaming space, always likes to experiment with new technologies, um, to, come onto the, to come onto the platform, maybe not even through the fund, because they're pretty well funded, but to just experiment with maybe making one item in the game, an NFT, and seeing if it could be interoperable in say maybe a metaverse within all of Ubisoft games. Is that a, is that a scenario that the Forte platform can help build? Yeah, absolutely. So we we are focused on many of the uh, developers that we're working with have many titles, and so one of the um, uh, values is especially in a game in a publisher like an Ubisoft or even your know, Disruptor Beam, as we talked about, uh, they want certain types of assets to be able to move between games. So I always think that. You know, I think blockchain gaming started with this idea that, oh, I, as a player, I could bring an asset into another game. I think that's, that's, as a game maker, it's a little bit challenging because you're like, I made this, I, I lovingly crafted this experience and it's designed a certain way. 
And if you bring a sword from World of Warcraft into my game, like, what does that even mean in my, you know, space shooter, for example? Right, will the stats transfer? Yeah, the will the stats, art be compatible? Right. right. So one of the, a lot of what we're starting with, with a lot of publishers, is like cosmetic things, right? So things that are just make you look a certain way in, in one game. Uh, we're working with several developers, uh, starting with cosmetics and other um, sort of um, non-functional type of digital goods. And we're allowing those players to be able to experiment with using those across you know, multiple different games. So that's something that we're really excited about. Um, like skins? Yeah, like skins. Okay. But then you know, we, we are absolutely working with developers on creating NFTs and other uh, functional items that give you real value in the game as well. So we're going to work across the whole spectrum. Uh, and I think when, when people talk about blockchain gaming, too often they just think about NFTs as like a singular you know, thing. But we, our vision at Forte and what, we, what our, our developers demand us to do is work across every single type of game asset, whether it's a fungible, you know, whether it's an earnable currency in the game, whether it's a premium currency in the game, a totally unique item, or one of many items that's limited, or just an unlimited number of you know, bullets that you can have in a game that you want to put on a blockchain. Like we we're basically support the entire spectrum of digital assets uh, in any game. I think it's very exciting that you have a platform that can help developers do turnkey NFTs or fungible uh, tokens. Um, I don't. Do you have a competitors in the space right now that are offering the same thing? Uh, I don't think people approach it the way that we do. Uh, we certainly have a ton of respect for you know the engine um, and Loom folks as well as you know, Dapper Labs. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of folks in the space that are pioneering some really great stuff. I think we come at it from the uh, perspective of having been in the gaming industry for a long time. My co-founders, um, you know, started Garage Games, sort of the you know one of the, the original sort of digital downloadable or digital client browser-based uh, you know gaming uh, technologies with something called Torque, um, and then went on to a bunch. And you know, then we have a bunch of uh, Unity folks and a bunch of uh, obviously Kabam folks. So we basically are a combination of people who've been. And then, of course, a bunch of distributed open source you know, engineers. Um, so we sort of combine kind of this, this uh, a team that has experience making you know, tools and platforms for games, as well as making the games themselves. And we kind of put it all together to, to form Forte. That's very exciting. In the minute we have left, can you share with us your outlook for 2020? What do you think is going to drive blockchain adoption? Uh, well, I'm a huge fan of what's happening in, in DeFi, which I'm sure most of this room is at this point. Um, so I think that you know, as uh, DeFi gets a little bit more mature, I think that has a potential to actually on-ramp a lot of um, you know, new uh, folks you know, into the space or new crypto users into the space. And of course, I'm super excited about gaming. I think what we're doing at Forte, when, when I think about Forte, it's not going to be, We'll be, re we'll be reaching tens of millions of players in 2020, and if we don't, I'll feel like a massive failure. Nobody better can do it than you, Kevin. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. That's our, that's our talk. Thanks. Oh, thank you, everyone.